Welcome back! In the last video, we established the fundamentals of Lagrangian mechanics and saw that we could obtain equations of motion for a simple one-dimensional system by first writing down the Lagrangian and then inserting it into the Euler-Lagrange equation. We will now come to appreciate the full power of the Lagrangian approach by solving a more complex system. But we should first briefly discuss two key concepts namely those of degrees of freedom and generalized coordinates. Let's consider a rigid body, such as this cylinder. If we introduce a Cartesian coordinate system, we realize that we need three independent coordinates to describe the position of the cylinder, or rather, any given point on it. A convenient reference point for a free body is its center of mass, which I've here marked with green. Since we need three coordinates to describe the location of the center of mass, there are also three directions in which it can be translated. Any conceivable translation can then be thought of as a sequence of very small, simultaneous translations in all three base directions. This sheds some light on an inherent property of three-dimensional space. We generally require three numbers to uniquely describe the position or translation of a point, and we say that any given point has three translational degrees of freedom. But since a rigid body is essentially a collection of a huge number of atoms, and each one could be modeled as a point particle, it would seem like our cylinder should have an almost infinite number of degrees of freedom. But this is of course where the word rigid comes into play. Since the distance between any two points on the cylinder is assumed to remain constant at all times, we can conveniently describe their combined motion in terms of rotations about some reference point, such as the center of mass. I find that it helps to imagine a second set of axes attached to the cylinder with respect to which we measure rotations. There are then three ways in which the cylinder can be rotated about these axes, Any arbitrary rotation can then be described in terms of these three basic rotations, and we say that a rigid body has three rotational degrees of freedom. Putting this together, we can describe any motion of the cylinder in terms of translation of its center of mass, along with rotation of the rest of the cylinder about the center of mass, and these two types of movement can happen simultaneously and independently. This implies that our cylinder has six degrees of freedom in total, meaning that we need six independent coordinates to uniquely describe its position and orientation at a given time. Luckily, we rarely need all six, since a given mechanical system usually has one or several constraints. Each such constraint reduces the number of degrees of freedom by one, since it essentially allows us to write one coordinate in terms of the other coordinates or even demands that some coordinate is always constant. For example, we could place a pivot at the origin, and attach the cylinder to it with a light string having some constant length ls, such that the x, y and z coordinates are related. This constraint effectively kills one translational degree of freedom, and leaves us with a cylindrical pendulum. Furthermore, we could assume that the string cannot be twisted, which removes one rotational degree of freedom. We might also want to restrict the cylinder such that it can only swing back and forth in the xc plane, which kills two additional degrees of freedom. By the way, let's adopt the pendulum convention, where we flip the axes such that the positive z direction is downwards. We're now almost ready to determine the Lagrangian for this system, the only issue is that Cartesian coordinates are ill-suited for describing the kind of rotational motion we expect from a pendulum. Thankfully, it turns out that we don't really have to use them. If you watched the last video, you might recall that while deriving the Euler-Lagrange equation, our main requirement was that trajectories had to be uniquely defined, but beyond that, we didn't really place any demands on the variables we used to actually describe these trajectories. <laughs> 
This essentially means that we are free to choose the coordinates we want to use. All we need right now are two numbers which uniquely define the position and orientation of the cylinder at a given time. For this reason, the cues are usually referred to as generalized coordinates. Anyway, to describe the translation of the cylinder, a point of interest would obviously be the spot where the string is attached. This point is free to move along a circular path around the origin, and can therefore easily be expressed in terms of the angle between the string and its z-axis. Let's call this angle theta1 and use it as our first coordinate. The orientation of the cylinder can then be expressed in terms of the angle between the cylinder and the vertical, which we can use as our second coordinate, call it theta2. Now that we've chosen our coordinates, the next step is to write down the Lagrangian, which entails finding expressions for the kinetic and potential energies. We start with the kinetic energy T. Since translations and rotations of the cylinder can be considered independently, its total kinetic energy can be decomposed into two terms, the first representing translational kinetic energy of the center of mass, and the second represents rotational kinetic energy about the center of mass. Let's look at the rotational term first. In case you don't know what the I stands for, it's called the moment of inertia, and in essence, it is a measure of how the mass of a body is distributed about a given axis of rotation. In the present case, we are considering an axis through the center of mass, and perpendicular to the xz plane. More generally, the moment of inertia is a rank 2 tensor, or a 3 by 3 matrix, but when dealing with planar rotations, we can get away with using this scalar version. To find it, we generally need to evaluate the volume integral, but there are lots of tables listing moments of inertia for common rigid bodies and rotational axes, so I'm going to take the easy way out here and just write down the correct expression, which involves the length of the cylinder, Lc and this radius, r. The angular velocity of the cylinder, omega, is perhaps the easiest part to figure out, as it is simply the rate of change of theta 2. So that's it for the rotational part of the kinetic energy. Let's now try to figure out the translational part by finding the speed of the center of mass. We can express the position of the center of mass in terms of a vector from the origin to the point where the string is attached, call it r1, plus a vector from this point to the center of mass, which we call r2. We can then easily express these vectors in terms of the angles theta1 and theta2. x hat and z hat are here of course basis vectors in the x and z directions, respectively. Let's hide the diagram for now to create some space, and combine these equations. Let's also factor the result in terms of the unit vectors. Now, to find the velocity, we need to differentiate this position vector with respect to time, remembering that the angles themselves are of course functions of time. The squared speed is then simply the sum of the squared components. If we proceed to expand these squares, we end up with this complicated thing. But if we factor some of the terms, we can use a bit of trigonometry to simplify things considerably. This gives us a much nicer expression, which allows us to complete our formula for the kinetic energy. And we can clean it up a bit further by factoring out one half times the mass and combining a couple of terms. Now we need to find the potential energy, so let's return to our diagram for a moment. In the last video, we realized that our choice of zero level for the potential energy doesn't affect the Lagrangian in any significant way, 
So for simplicity, let's place it at the origin. The potential energy of the cylinder is then given by its mass times the gravitational acceleration times the z-coordinate of the center of mass. We need a minus sign since we're using an upside-down coordinate system, and the potential energy decreases as the z-position increases. Conveniently, we already know the position of the center of mass, so we can just extract the z-component, and we have an expression for the potential energy ready to go along with the one for the kinetic energy. This allows us to write down the Lagrangian in terms of our coordinates. It is now time to apply the Euler-Lagrange equations for theta 1 and 2. I'll show the general form on the right in case you've forgotten what it looks like. Let's start by working out the left-hand side of the equation for theta 1, which means that we differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to this angle. We then get the right-hand side by first differentiating the Lagrangian with respect to the rate of change of theta 1. We then differentiate the result with respect to time. We now set these expressions as equal, and after cancelling a couple of terms, dividing by one-half times the mass, rearranging and simplifying, we end up with this form. The procedure for theta 2 is completely analogous to what we just did for theta 1, so I won't show it, but you can carry it out yourself if you feel like it. Eventually, you should end up with something like this, where I have introduced a dimensionless constant alpha, which makes things look a bit nicer. Anyway, after all that work, we've managed to derive these equations of motion for the cylinder, which we still need to actually solve. The issue is that these differential equations are non-linear, since they involve both squares and trigonometric functions, and exact closed-form solutions to such equations are usually extremely hard to find. There are ways to get around the non-linearity, however, and I want to show two different ways of solving this system. The first involves linearizing the system and then solving it to obtain an approximate solution, which is valid for small oscillations. This first method involves a lot of cool concepts from linear algebra, such as eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and it allows us to get a feel for some of the key features of the system, like its eigenmodes. The second way is the brute force method, where we integrate these equations numerically to obtain a more exact solution, which is interesting in its own regard. But I think this has been enough for one video, so I'm going to end this one on a bit of a cliffhanger. The next few videos will then be dedicated to solving these equations and interpreting the solutions.